Hey, hey, people, Sleepy Reader here. I think I'm going to shoot two videos. So I'm going to, this video is a bunch of comic book thoughts of probably just throwing out stuff pretty quickly, just thoughts about some comics I've read in the past few weeks. I'm way behind on my reading, but I want to put some of this stuff out there. And then also uh, there was a big New Year's sale that started on Friday at Excalibur Books, which is just down the street there. Um, so I wanted to show you, I kind of went a little crazy. So, um, the next video will be the haul video of these back issues. No major things, my little obscurities that I, um, that I am collecting. I wish I could raise up this microphone a little, so I'm not sure how well the audio will be. But anyway, um... So I have been reading Kaiju Max Season 4. Really nothing new to say about it. Just want to remind people it's still out there. It's still good. It's still weird. It's dark. It's funny. Um, it's building up a lot of mysteries. Uh, if, if you haven't already read it, I would say grab the trades. You could start with Volume 1 or Volume 2, really. Volume 1 is cheaper, though. It is now. The first two volumes are now out in a deluxe hardback. So for you hardback collectors, I definitely recommend that. Um, but I would not recommend, I would recommend trying to read an issue, take a break, read another issue. Each issue is so dense. Um, I really, you really get your money's worth if you get the singles issues too. Single issues too. Um, so this one is kind of building up the mysteries and uh, keeping everything going. So I have high hopes for this season. What is it? Is it issue? F it's issue three. So we're halfway through the season, the fourth season of, of Kaiju Max. And so far I'm liking it better than season two. I loved season one, sorry, season three. I love season one and season two. Season three was good, but not as good. Um, and this is very strong. So hopefully that will keep, keep going that way. Batman Damned. Um, I think I've said it in comments on other people's videos. I really love this issue, this number two, issue number two. Um, it really clicked with me in its super over the topness in so many different ways from the, from the supernatural stuff to the intense, the oh, rid, almost ridiculous intensity of Batman and all the other characters. And, um, like I loved the the rap version of the demon J and Jason Blood <laughs> here. I thought that was great. And w and what the way it clicked for me is that this is like a rock and roll opera, um, a rock opera. You know, like Tommy by the Who or or what have you. Those kind of things um, really turned up to eleven. Really nuts. So, um, but if you take it that way, I think it's it's really good stuff. Uh, the only, still the only thing bothering me is that font, but I totally, that font of the uh, narration by, I think by John Constantine. Um, and, and the art is amazing and it really fits the kind of story that's going on here. Maybe, maybe Azarello knows what he's doing in writing for Bermejo. I'm not normally attracted to painted comics. Um. But this one, as I get into it, really works. And I, I'm so into it that I found on Hoopla the first issue available digitally. So I reread that digitally just to experience it a different way. And it was the art was very intense that way in the story. So after I read issue two and you know, I was clued into that sense of it being this crazed rock opera, I went back and I have all kinds of questions. Da Batman could be dead here. Maybe that's Batman damned. Maybe Batman is in hell here. Um, there could be other things. And there's the whole question of uh, Thomas Wayne having an affair. And uh, people have suggested maybe Batman and the Joker are um, our brothers. But anyway, uh, great stuff. I think, yeah, it seems the, uh, I love the version of Harley Quinn here. Um, you know, really clicked in on me when she is singing beat on the bat, beat on the bat, beat on the bat with a baseball bat. And if you know your Ramones, you know what that's a reference to. So, um, yeah, with that and the rap, it, it just all really worked for me. 
and uh, as an unusual revisioning of DC and the Batman world. <clears throat> it also strikes me, you know, if it were Scott Snyder, he would be out there doing all kinds of interviews, spinning how we read this. <coughs> Azzarello, as far as I know, is not out there in the press letting us know how to take this. We just have to figure it out as it comes, which is why the first issue I was a little uncertain. And now that I feel like I'm hooked into the way this story is being written and um, at least have my own theory of what Azzarello's intent is, I have a way to read this that makes it extra exciting. I've read the first three issues of Infinite Dark. And it's both, it shows a lot of science, it, it's like got some really cool science fiction ideas about the universe has died from entropy and there's this one habitat that has some anti-entropic force around it <coughs> that's keeping all the people inside of it live so it's the last life in our universe and <coughs> this society that's trying to go on and then the, the mystery of a murder. You know, so it's kind of familiar stuff, but it takes it all in a way that feels really cool to me. You know, um, a little bit like the movie Sunshine and Event Horizon and things like that. But it's its own thing. But it's very clumsily written. And I really hated it for the first, like, issue and a half. And as I got used to kind of some of the ways uh, in the writing that, that didn't progress the story very well or where it was hard to tell who the characters were. The, the writer just doesn't have the right balance and doesn't use the things you need, like tagging the characters enough or what have you, that, um, that yeah, it's a little hard to get into. But as a science fiction fan, to me, it's actually one of the more interesting science fiction comics out there at the same time. That's one of the ironies of science fiction often for me. The, the potential of the content can transcend some of the weaknesses in the presentation. Uh, maybe it's just very hard to present hard science fiction, if this will turn out to be hard science fiction. It's veering towards horror. It also has interesting essays in it where people write es different people write essays about horror. And I was uh, really taken by one person talking about the horror of being a millennial and being born into this world where we're expecting uh, uh, ecological catastrophe coming up and what are you going to do about it? And the previous generations have dumped this problem in your lap. Um, so that's, anyway, all those, uh, and I often don't read back matter, but I got caught up in this back matter. So that kind of added to my pleasure to it. And I, I think it's all, you know, it's all copyright by the writer. And I, you definitely get a sense of an artist who's doing an okay job, but isn't putting, here's one of the better pages actually, but isn't really overall putting his all into it, which also maybe adds to the weakness. But I felt like the colorist on this was really putting his all into it and really working hard to make the story work and to give it the right mood and stuff that, that the artist was probably only you know halfway there um, so yeah it's a mixed bag but I'm really enjoying it and then let's see these are in no particular order Black Hammer Cthulhu Louise was okay I think I expected more um, in effect in effect it was a very simple tale of the outsider who's being treated as a bad person becomes a bad person. Uh, sorry for the spoilers there. Um, I guess I won't tell you exactly how. The, the art was pretty cool. The coloring was neat. It was kind of fun to have Dave Stewart. Is Dave Stewart the colorist? No, maybe not. For some reason I thought Dave Stewart was the colorist on this. But it just says Emmy Lennox. That's weird, I was so sure. Oh, it says Dave Stewart on the cover. So I think Dave Stewart cover, coloring over this, over Emmy Lennox, who's a very different kind of artist than we normally see Dave Stewart coloring over. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, and it's fun to see her art. I just think uh, it was kind of a trifle as far as the Black Hammer universe goes. 
as opposed to um, Quantum Age, which is rapidly is currently my favorite Black Hammer comic, as the Black Hammer, the main Black Hammer, Black Hammer comic itself, is kind of at a low ebb for me at the moment. Quantum Age just keeps getting better with each issue, and in this issue, it um, it takes up the mantle of some of the plotting of the original Black not plotting, but some of the connecting material. So it's very interesting where this will go. Does this only have one more issue? It's issue five, and I think it was a six issue minis. Uh, but I really want <clears throat> more of that. And again, Incredible Colors by Dave Stewart. It feels like um, Wilfredo Torres's art, is, which I already liked, is getting stronger. And, and maybe the colorist is... Um, being inspired by that. So um, we always get good colors from Dave Stewart, but it, it felt, I really noticed them a lot in this issue. Then there was Freedom Fighters, uh, rich, written by uh, Robert Vendetti. I th I'm not sure because I, my memory's not good enough. It might be that this is the version of Earth that we saw in Multiversity where Hitler was ruling. Um, I don't remember that issue of Multiversity that well, except that Hitler was on the toilet at the beginning of the comic. And I think we had Uncle Sam in that comic. And um, we had an evil Superman. I don't know if he's still in the picture here. I can't remember what happened in that. Or maybe this is some other universe where the Nazis won. Anyway, uh, this was powerful stuff with uh, surprised me at the deaths of a number of people and also uh, really cool to have a whole series of plastic men as kind of a, a Gestapo type, an arm of the Gestapo. <laughs> They're really well done. The art in here was very good from Eddie Barrows. There were moments where it, it, it's a little bit on the standard DC side for me, and, and uh, um, but overall strong stuff this. One surprise for me here, um, I haven't noticed this in a DC comic before, I probably can't find it. One of the characters gives the finger <laughs> in the comic book. Um, oh, and in, uh, and in Batman Damned, they use the F word a lot, which also surprised me because I was reading about how the top executive at DC was upset with the with the bat wang in the previous book, I didn't know if if they'd be looking closely at this and maybe they would have re re removed some of the cussing. But but the F word appears a lot in there, F and S and such. So uh, there's a loosening of language lately in comic books. <clears throat> language and imagery of that middle finger. Uh, Wonder Woman continues to be very disappointing. I don't... I don't see anything special that new writer G. Willow Wilson is doing here. I had way too high expectations. Um, I, th <laughs> I had thought when, when he first appeared that Ares was Steve Trevor, but he's just some version of Ares that had died and come back. Uh, I guess in the Brian Azzarello version, Ares does die, and Diana becomes the goddess of war, doesn't she? But it's a completely different Aries, and the whole the context is just lost on me. I have missed a lot of Wonder Woman issues, so there might be stuff he's referring to. Uh, she's referring to, sorry. Um, and the art just feels very loosey-goosey, and it just doesn't carry any weight to me. And it doesn't carry much drama or something. It, it's almost like we're looking more at breakdowns, so to speak, than full art amongst other things. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the weaker DC comics that I read, unfortunately. Just wanted to mention curse words, still really good stuff. We got our um, focus on the koala character, uh, Margaret. She's a really cool character. I don't know how they keep this, this comic interesting, but they do, uh, issue after issue. It's one of those ones I know I'm going to have fun reading. It usually goes to the top of my stack of that week. 
another happy thing which I mentioned, which we mentioned in uh, the video I did with my daughter, but I just wanted to mention Shazam again. Uh, I found it a real joy to read. It was not a dark Shazam, and it was it was a lot having a lot of fun with the idea of the Captain Marvel family, although they can't call them Captain Marvel anymore. Um, I just find myself really looking forward to the next issue and um, really surprised that Jeff Johns can do this kind of fun work. I'm, I'm guessing this is telling us something about what the movie's going to be like that's coming up, that it's going to be a lighter fun, and perhaps Jeff Johns was asked to move towards the way the movie was, or maybe he was involved in the movie, I don't know. Um, hopefully Jeff Johns will stick with this and stick with the tone he's created here, and Dave and Eaglesham will stick with it and, uh, and will really explore this kind of fun young adult fantasy of, of uh, Shazam because I really dig it. I can read it to my daughter. She really enjoys it. So I think I read that Damage is Ending maybe on number 13. And I make fun of this comic, but knowing that it's ending, I feel really sad. I kind of... Or maybe it's, maybe it's ending later than issue 13, but... Some websites have pointed out where the solicits show it's no longer coming out. Um, but I guess I just really ha enjoy having a really, really light comic, superhero comic, in my, in my reading experience. So it's actually one I, especially with the Aaron Lopresti art, that I jump right on and read right away. Because it, it takes so little emotional drain off of me, but I have fun reading it. Okay, well, very much the opposite, but um, possibly rising to be in the top five or ten comics on my pull list, but it's only issue three, <laughs> is Lucifer. and the, So I'm really enjoying it and all the elements of it. The only problem is that it really feels written for the trade with not much in the way not throwing much of a bone to the monthly reader in the sense of making, of the rhythms of it and everything, uh, making it easier for you to get back into after being away for, for a month. But uh, really cool, so many cool elements. Now in this issue, we get a lot of William Blake, and I really have always been intrigued by William Blake. Makes me wanna find out a little more, bit more about the real William Blake's life. He seems to be in this limbo with with Lucifer. Um, another example of, of really good coloring. Let me see. You know, the colorist here really focuses on the mood of the of the different scenes and and really works it that way. Where are the credits? I guess on the cover, the colorist is Dave McCaig. I guess he's a pretty famous colorist. So so that probably makes a lot of sense. I don't want to show spoilery pages. There's some things in here that confused me, um, but not on the level, more on the level of, oh, either I'm going to find out more about that later on, or I need to go back to the earlier issues to remind myself of some of this connective tissue. But it, if, it's, if it's going the way it seems, it's going to be a really brilliantly, brilliant tapestry of a story of a bunch of characters that are linked to Lucifer and Lucifer himself. Um, hopefully it gets however much time it needs to do that story. Um, we saw the, um, now presumably there's so much, been so much money made by the Sandman franchise in the past that they'll assume they're gonna make a lot of money in trades on this. So even if sales on the individual issues don't live up but I was thinking about how uh, young adult think the young sorry young animal line seems so good, and then in the second act of uh, young animals, it just sort of seemed like everyone was rushing to wrap up their stories, and that would be a, a huge shame with Lucifer. Exo Man of War. Um, this current arc uh, keeps getting better. I guess it kind of wraps up right here, does it? Um, I'm trying to remind myself. So many comics, so little time. But, uh, yeah, it, it wraps up, but it leaves us in a really interesting place 
where, which I hope is followed up on pretty soon, and I hope it's followed up on in Exo Man of War, but it may, it may really be bleeding over into the general uh, Valiant universe, which for me means I probably will miss some some of it, because I just only get some Valiant comics. The other thing is that the um, the art from Juan Jose Wright and his colorist. Was probably is that Andrew Dollhouse is the colorist? I'm guessing. <clears throat> yeah, Andrew Dollhouse is the colorist. They're really clicking by now on their third issue together. <coughs> um, it feels like Wright is putting more energy and more creativity in this issue than he was in the previous ones. I hope again that he's not off with. They seem to do three issue story arcs in Exo Man of War, so I'm hoping or mini arcs. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll see more of Ripe on Exo Man of War, ideally next issue, but if not, on another um, three issue arc soon. <clears throat> and then another one I really am liking. I'm glad that there's so many here I'm liking. And there's so many comics I haven't read yet. Um, but I read, I managed to read issues two and three of Sparrowhawks. Sparrow Hawk, which is just going to be five issues, and it's kind of a twisted young adult fantasy land of fairy Alice in Wonderland ish in a way. Um, you know, sword and sorcery meets Alice in Wonderland. Um, the interior art's very different than the painted covers, but it's really excellent and has excellent color. Um, <coughs> so I should mention the artist. Matthias Basla and colored by Rebecca Nolte. So both those people I should look for more. And the writer's very good too. Um, someone Dawson. I think she's normally a young adult novelist. Delilah S. Dawson. <clears throat> but this is progressing really nicely. It's fun to read. There's a kind of moral question here. There's a very dreamlike quality to it too. There's some urgency, but not too much urgency, so you can kind of enjoy the journey through the land of fairy and the whimsical characters. And yeah, it just has a really nice, fairly unique touch. High heaven, still good. St. Peter's using the F word. That's a little weird. Um, apparently, it's going to wrap up in the next issue, and that's really my only complaint. I'd like to spend... I'd like to spend maybe 12 issues follow, uh, exploring this little version of the afterlife and these characters because it's it's become more interesting with um, with him becoming a roommate with his with the person who you know mocked him and perhaps egged him on to death who then killed himself. Anyway, lots of cool stuff, funny. Cool, cool art and colors again. Yeah. The cover, I'm not sure. It's like the woman character who just appears a little falling into a giant swirl of uh, pimento. What do you call it? The That kind of meat. Is it pimento? I don't know. Falling into some kind of lunch meat. <laughs> now there is constant reference to something called L meat. Um, anyway, fun book. I also picked up Die, which I was, I heard some other people raving about it, so I grabbed it kind of late on, and I'm not sure if I want to keep reading this or not, or if I want to read it in trade. It certainly was a fun read. It, it had a nice, this issue had a nice momentum, but it, it felt very familiar somehow. The, the people who all got together and did something that turned out badly as teenagers and each one's a type and they quickly explain which which types they all are and then we see them later when they've all grown up years later and what happened to them which were not totally revealed about what it was yet um, comes back to haunt him so it and and then they get sucked back into the fantasy world of of the early part of the no, the novel the story so I just feel like it's something I've seen in movies and read in books and possibly other comic books. But it, it seems like it's going to be a really fun read. And if I have any real 
objection to it it really more is the um, the digital painted art by Stephanie Hans it's I don't know it, it's very good in a way and yet in another way it feels too artificial it doesn't breathe and live enough for me um, a lot of work was put into it it's like um, watercolor illustrations done by a very slick but possibly not very soulful painter <clears throat> so you can almost see it as storyboards for a movie a very very uh, very uh, lush storyboards for a movie perhaps and I'm not I'm not a uh, RPG person. I've never, uh, when I was in high school, there were only very few people who had just started doing Dungeons and Dragons. So by the time role-playing games really came into their own, I was already busy doing other things. So for maybe people who do role-playing games, I've, I gather are even are more into this comic. It is a very, it's a very solid comic, Die is. Um, maybe I'll just keep getting it if I if I feel like I don't have enough indie fantasy books to read already. Much to my shock, because I part of me was like, oh crap, because I have the terrifics on my pull list, I have to get by the um, annual. And it's kind of ridiculous having annuals on these comics that apparently aren't selling very well, and most of them are about to be canceled, and none of them have been around for, well, maybe they've been around for just a year now. Um, but this Terrifics Annual contained three really good independent stories. Um, the first one was most independent. You could read it all by itself without having any connection to the Terrifics other comics. And then the other two were kind of fill in, fill in the blanks, but very artfully. Like I think this one about Origin of the Species, about this caveman character, whose name I can't remember right at the moment. Um, what's his name? Anyways, the caveman character who's in, who's in love with Rex's girlfriend, uh, it kind of gives his backstory by Mark Russell of the Flintstones fame. And it makes, it makes what in other hands would just be kind of a by-the-numbers filler, makes it uh, very interesting stuff and makes this whole character very interesting. And as he is becoming kind of the one of the major bad guys of the Terrifics, it would be great if all this character development here really pays off in future Terrifics issues, if the Terrifics is not about to be canceled. And then the other, um, the other story kind of filled in how Tom Strong, because we saw the message from Tom Strong at the beginning of the first book, first the first issue of the Terrifics, so it fills in how, how Tom Strong ended up in this place and ended up leaving this message, but didn't end up dead. <laughs> Even though the message says, if you're hearing this, I must be dead, Bob. Um, and you would think that would be a very weak story, but James Asmus and the artist, Jose Luis, really make a fun story out of it. And uh, really good colors by Hi-Fi. Um, so if you were have been enjoying the Terrifics and you didn't get the annual, see if you can pick it up. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoy getting a lot of short stories. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes short, you know, this is three short stories, so it's not a huge collection of short stories, but all three of them hit the mark for me, um, which is unusual. Hawkman that I've been loving has taken a funny turn in issue seven, which I guess is the beginning of the next arc, but it's really just a Nothing was really resolved in the last arc, where we had a lot of adventures with Hawkman exploring his past. But now we're, I guess, seeing the earliest incarnation of Qatar, where he's a kind of mass murderer working for some cosmic being. And it kind of makes sense, but it also... <coughs> I don't know, it pushes my suspension of disbelief a little too far. And it's maybe not... You know, you don't always know what you want out of a story, but but uh, 
as I've been enjoying this Hawkman story of him trying to figure out his past and all his past incarnations and different worlds he's lived on in different incarnations, this is not <laughs> this is not the kind of answer that I would want. It's not a complete answer yet. It doesn't fit it all into why this earliest incarnation of him is who he is and why he somehow is trying in the end decides because of some mysterious unknown woman who keeps showing up on all the battlefields why he turns against his master or even who his master is and what his master was really after is kind of there's a a cloud of vagueness over it so i don't know a hawkman will probably uh, redeem itself in future issues but i'm a little nervous with issue seven after s the first six issues you know being so strong for me Wow, kind of ending on a down note there. Uh, almost all those comics I told you about I really loved. I am surprised because it's uh, written by Mark and Draco that I have been enjoying these issues of Supergirl. So I'm just throwing this in. I wasn't originally going to talk about it because we may t I may talk about it more with my daughter if she wants to do another video. Um, there's a lot of bits of laziness in the writing here and convenient things and stuff like that but it's also there's great cliffhangers and it kind of keeps us on the edge of our seat and it's fun to read so so f hopefully it can you know the it's on a long arc set you know that they've been set off on by brian michael bendis and his whole rogel czar thing so i'm assuming she can't really resolve everything herself it's got to all come back to superman someday but in the meantime it's kind of a fun journey um as a supergirl comic um still loving you know whenever crypto appears and there's there's someone from the planet brainiac comes from and he's a fun addition of a character <clears throat> the um the 25th issue as if that's really special it made it 25 issues so let's do a double size issue ha literally has twice as many pages but one of the stories is about this um this uh character i can't remember the name of the planet that brainiac comes from um who's kind of i guess a combination of a of a um what is he like a linguist or something and a archaeologist a little bit of a uh what do you call it uh, raiders of the lost ark type of character i guess in outer space there was a kind of cheesy old school dan jurgens supergirl story at the end which was kind of fun but feels very disconnected from modern comics um Definitely a flashback to the late 80s or something, but enjoyable in its own way. Okay, my ambition to do that. Um, now, I'll, 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 I'm going to film right after this. I'm going to film my, my haul video. Hopefully I will make it not too long. Thanks for hanging in there. If you've made it all 33 minutes, I will be back soon. I, oh, and I also, I'm hoping tomorrow or new year's day to do a vlog about my thoughts about my the state of the union of comic books of the past year of 19 of uh, 2018 so um that's my ambition talk to you later